Hey, I'm Hunter from Skill Thrive, and in this video, I'm gonna show you four examples of how to use the CSS target pseudo class to create interactive elements on the page without needing any JavaScript. Feel free to jump to the examples using the timestamps in the description. But before we dive in, I wanna take some time and explain how the target pseudo class works and some of the drawbacks of using it. First, let's talk about how it works. The target pseudo class represents a unique element with an ID matching the URL's fragment. For example, this header tag has an ID of section one. We then can create an anchor tag that will act as a trigger for the target class by passing the ID of section one into the href. Also notice how we pass a pound sign before the ID name, just like you would when styling IDs in CSS. Now when a user clicks on the link, the URL in the browser will be updated with the ID at the end. The default behavior will be for the browser to jump to the part of the page where the element with the matching ID is located. This is fine if you're creating something like a table of contents, but sometimes this isn't the experience you want. You could fix this behavior using JavaScript, which I'll show you an example of, but then that bears the question, why not just use JavaScript to begin with? And that's a great question. The answer is it all completely depends on the situation. If you get a desired effect without writing a lot or any JavaScript, that's great, but sometimes it's harder trying to avoid using JavaScript at all. So with that in mind, remember that the examples I'm showing you today are to show you how powerful the target pseudo class can be and to show you some creative examples. It's not intended to be some sort of magical replacement for JavaScript in all the situations you'll come across. The last thing I want to mention is that I'm going to explain some of the challenges faced with each example and some possible workarounds. With that, let's jump into our first example, tabs. So on the left, we have the tab example. And if we clicked on tab two, you'll see at the top that tabs dash dash two is now uh, in the URL, which allows us to then uh, style tabs two specifically to show the content of tabs two while hiding tab one and tab three's content. Um, and let's go ahead now with that and look at how the HTML is built. And you see here, if we scroll down, I have this wrapping class called tabs. I then have a span element, which actually is the ID that we're gonna be targeting. And this has a class of tab switch. We then have the anchor tag, which we're going to use to click and then target this in order to change the URL. And this is our tabs link class. And below that, we have the tab content, which is some uh, paragraph tags. And I repeated this two more times to have three sections. And that's basically everything as far as the HTML. So let's look at the CSS and get an idea of how uh, this is working. So let's go into our styles.css here. If we scroll up, you can see that we're passing in this display block once that uh, target matches. So on the tab switch, remember that the ID is what we're looking for. So if the ID equals the one that's in the URL, we're going to then pass styles down. And this is why I did it this way is because this is going to essentially just be like this invisible element that's kind of just listening for this URL change and then passing down styles to um, adjacent uh, um, elements. So you can see here that it changes it to display block. So by default, if we scroll down, you can see that tabs content by default has a display of none, so it's hidden. And another thing I want to mention here is that the float right is really important in this situation. So if you look at the uh, HTML, the links here for tab one, tab two, and then tab three are not next to each other in the HTML, but the way they appear on this uh, demo page is that they're next to each other. And the way that I achieve this is by floating the content to the right. So essentially it pushes it down and then the rest of it will float back up to the top. So that gives us the effect that these are kind of like list elements or something like that, um, but they're not. And we can keep all those tabs and tab contents close to each other in our HTML. And the last thing we did here for CSS, as far as using the target um, pseudo selector is styling the tabs link. So what this means is that if it matches, just go ahead and add this border bottom to um, the, the link tag, which essentially just signifies that this is an active uh, tab. So this is the tab that we're actually looking at currently. And another thing you might've no noticed is if we got rid of this here and just hit enter, 
it defaults to tab dash one, which makes it look like tab one is the default tab, which is what you would expect, right? Now, this isn't something I could achieve in CSS, so I had to turn to JavaScript in order to get this effect. So if we come in and look at this functions.js file, you can see the function that we're running here, and it's really simple. The first thing it does is to see if there's even a hash available in the URL. If it doesn't, the function just stops running. Now, if this isn't, uh, you know, if it does have a hash, is this then going to uh, create a variable? And this variable is going to be equal to the first tabs section uh, in tabs link. So in this case, because this is the first one in the HTML, it's going to be this element. And then now that it has this element, it's going to run a click event on it, which instead of us having to click on it, JavaScript's going to do it for us, therefore passing that into the URL, which is going to give us that default behavior. So that's everything for the tab example. Let's jump into our next example, which is a modal. So on the left, you can see here that we have essentially the same design, but now we have this button up here, which is going to, when clicked, uh, make a modal appear. And if we want, we can click on close and then it reverts back to the closed state. So let's go ahead and look at our uh, HTML and see what's going on here. So you can see here right um, after the body, I have this container and it's pretty simple. This is all that's going on with the modal. We first have a modal container, which is the ID. This is what we're going to be looking for. And because this is what we're looking for, we pass that down here on the button. So it's the same ID and then we uh, have to pass in the pound sign before uh, the, the name of the, uh, the ID that we're looking for. So once we click on that, that's going to trigger the styles and we can use the target pseudo class in order to uh, style that. And uh, here again, we just have uh, a div called modal content. And this is going to be the white section of um, the modal, which is going to have the close button the header, and then a paragraph tag. And then uh, this modal container is going to be styled to essentially look like an overlay. So let's go and look at our styles.css and see what's going on here. Now, here is this everything we're doing for the target pseudo class. And everything else is pretty uh, straightforward. We're not doing anything special here besides just regular uh, styling. But you'll see here that we're using the not pseudo class as well in order to style this when this is not active. And what this is going to allow us to do is saying that once this doesn't have anything in it, it's just going to look like this. So it's going to have these styles of opacity zero, visibility of hidden, and we also want to pass in a transition property where we target opacity and visibility, passing in some animation properties here. What this is going to allow us to do is once this changes from target, not target, excuse me, to target, it's going to apply these changes to those properties and give us a really nice fade in effect. And you can see here that once this matches, so uh, we're taking away the not selector, we're going to just set the opacity to one, set visibility to visible, and we also need to pass in transition uh, here as well, because once we go from target active to not target, we still want it to fade out. And that's basically everything on how to get the modal to look the way we want. Super simple and effective use case for the target pseudo class. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to our next example, which is a slide out navigation drawer. So this example is actually really similar to the modal, but instead of a modal appearing, we're just having a navigation menu appearing, but we are approaching it a little differently uh, in the CSS. So you can see here, if we click on menu, the nav appears, we have this close button, we can click here and the navigation closes. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, that's a really big gotcha when you're using target uh, pseudo classes is that if you're a user and you come in and you're clicking around and you have these URLs changing, and you're like, okay, I'm done here. I wanna go back to the last page that I was on and you click this back button, it would actually just refer you back to the last URL, which was this, this state um, of the menu being out. And I don't know if you've ever come across that off of like a Google search you, and there's like a gallery and the gallery has like 20 something images and you're going through them. You're like, oh, okay, this is cool. 
and you looked at all the images and you go and click back to go back to your Google results. And you have to click it like 20 times just to go back to your Google results. And I think in a scenario like that, I would really rely more on JavaScript and not use and rely on your URL changing in order to add styles. So that's just something to consider um, if you're trying to apply something similar in your project. All right, so now that we have that, um, one thing you can see is that if we scroll down and then click close, the position of this doesn't go up to the top, which is the default behavior. And I'm gonna be showing you how we got around that in another JavaScript function um, that we had to write for this. But before we do that, let's go ahead and just look at the HTML. You can see right after the body, we have this nav with an ID of menu and just some anchor tags. One of the anchor tags is the close and the other one is the placeholder for the links. And because the ID is what we want to target, the button here has the href set to the menu ID right here. If we come into our styles, you can see that we're actually only using the target selector once. So on the menu, we have position fixed, top zero, right negative 40, and then width 40 and then the height of the hunter, so it's gonna take up the full space. Now this is really important, of the right negative 40 and the width of 40. So what that means is that, you know, instead of, because uh, it's 40% wide, if we move it over negative 40% to the right, it essentially just going to hide it because that 40% is the same amount. And what we're gonna do is that once this target is active, we're just gonna set right to zero. So it's gonna just gonna move it back to uh, being flush to the side. So if we set this to zero and save it, you'll see that that's the default state now, but that's not what we want. We want it to be negative 40, so it's off the screen. And in order to get that uh, nice smooth animation, we just again pass in a transition here where we target the right property give it a 0.3 second animation and then a timing effect of ease. And we did the same thing here because we want it to slide back smoothly once we got rid of that target and it no longer had a matching hash in the URL. All right, so that was a really simple example. We're only using this once, but remember that default behavior of jumping up and how that's kind of weird and we don't really want our user to have to experience that. And that's when you would have to pass in a function like this. Now, don't worry if you're not familiar with uh, JavaScript, I'll just go ahead and explain this the best way I can in layman's terms. So the first thing we're doing at the top is that we're storing um, everything that has a hash, all the anchor tags that have a hash, we're storing it in this variable called hash links. And then what we're doing is that we have an uh, empty array and for each thing, each hash link, we're going to pass the link down and then add a click event handler or listen handler onto that. And what it's gonna do is that once we click on it, it's going to prevent the default behavior. Now remember I said the default behavior is to jump to the section of um, where the ID matches. So in this case, because it's up here, if we scroll down and clicked on close, it would jump back up here. And just to prove that, let's go ahead and get rid of this and save it. Click here, I'm gonna scroll down and then click on close. You can see how it jumps to the top. We don't want that. And this function helps us with that. Now because it's preventing the default. Part of the default is adding that hash to the uh, URL, which gives it the ability to style the target. So that is what this is doing up here, is it's just putting the, uh, the uh, hash back into the URL after it prevents it the default. So then it doesn't go up to the top, but it still triggers those styles and we can style appropriately. All right. so. Hopefully that wasn't too much there on the JavaScript, but you can see again, another example of how we have to incorporate JavaScript if we want to avoid a default behavior of using the target pseudo class. So our last example is being able to change the global styles using the target pseudo class. So let's go ahead and jump into that example and check that out. So in this example, I actually have to scroll down a little bit, click on the dark mode button 
And you'll see that the global styles change. The background's now dark. The text is now light. If we click on the light mode, it reverts back to the default state without the target selected. And the HTML on this is actually really simple. All I did is I wrapped the content in a div called ID and passed that ID and set it to dark. And because this is what we're targeting, we have to pass that into the href for our dark mode button. So if we go ahead and scroll down here, you'll see here on this dark mode button, we're targeting that ID right here. And that's everything for the HTML. The magic happens in the CSS, which is also really simple. So let's go ahead and check out the styles.css here. And you can see here that we're then targeting the body and one dark is the target. We're changing the background color to this black. And we're also targeting um, elements uh, within that div, the content uh, header, as well as the content paragraph and link. And all we're doing here is we're changing the content to the white and the other two elements to the gray. And that's everything in order to get this, um, this effect where we're changing the global uh, variables. Now, it would be a disservice to um, make this or have this come off like this is, you know, you set dark mode and then you just kind of hang around and go around your site and dark mode persist. This isn't going to persist the state, right? So imagine if, you know, you had dark mode on and then you went to another link, you'll see that it takes that dark mode away. So uh, the way you can think about this is, let's say for instance, you had uh, you know a custom font and you wanted to give the user the ability to see what that font looked like on a darker background or a blue or yellow background. This would be a good example of a use case for this. It isn't something that's supposed to be persisted uh, just because that's not really what the target pseudo class is capable of doing. Now, another thing I want to mention before we wrap all of this up is that just like our last example, if we scroll down here and clicked on this, it would scroll all the way back up where this div ID originally was. So let's come back into our functions and just get rid of this and comment it out, save it, click, and you'll see that it changes, but then it jumps up to the top. So just like the last function that I mentioned um, in the previous example, Let's go ahead and add that to our function, functions.js file and save that. And now once we click on that, it stays down where we actually were when we clicked the button. And there you have it. Those are the four ways you can use the target pseudo class to create interactive elements without needing JavaScript. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more development and design content. Also, if you have any other examples, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.